I'm going to be talking about estimated placental volume, EPV, the way to prevent the most common cause of stillbirth. I'd like to start by sharing a story about one of my patients, MM. She was 25 years old in 36 weeks and four days uh, when she presented to her doctor with a blood pressure of 142 over 83, which was a little elevated for her. And she was told to watch out for hypertension precautions. Within about a week, less than a week, she actually developed these, which are headaches, visual spots, and edema for about a day. They said, you need to go to labor and delivery. By the time she got there, um, her blood pressure had gone down. They looked at her urine for protein, which is a test for preeclampsia, and it just had a little bit. And then they did a non-stress test to make sure everything was okay. Non-stress test is basically an electronic fetal monitoring strip at the same time looking at uterine contractions. You can see on the bottom the spikes of the uterine contractions. And normally whenever there's a uterine contraction, there should be an elevation in fetal heart rate, which there was. So this was read as normal and she was sent home. She complained of decreased fetal movement uh, about a week later. She came into labor and delivery again. She had another non-stress test. It was again normal, so they sent her home. But they said, maybe come back in a week if you don't have any problems so we can check you again. She did at 39 weeks and three days. The NST was again normal, so she was sent home. Sadly, on the next day, she presented with a stillbirth. This is, of course, a tragic event. Why did this happen? Well, as you heard from Beatrix just earlier, we've looked at a series of stillbirths in our cohort at Yale University, and we found that the most common cause of stillbirth was a small placenta. And that's exactly what happened to MM, unfortunately. The placenta of her fetus was less than the first percentile. And in this case, it was small because there was decreased blood flow, which led to infarction, death of the placenta, buildup of fibrin and calcifications. So this is one of many cases that I've had over the years like this. And after getting several of these cases, I wondered, why didn't the OBs know that the placenta was so small? My thinking was that if they had known that, maybe they would not have sent her home. And I think the reasons are complex, but part of it is that the focus in obstetrics in general is on the fetus, which of course is what everybody's you know, waiting for, a healthy baby. And I, I understand that. But from my point of view, not knowing the size of the placenta is like driving a car without a gas gauge. And how does a car drive a minute before it runs out of gas? Perfectly normally. And then all of a sudden it runs out of gas and it stops. So I reasoned and I wondered again, could we measure the size of the placenta? And I asked my colleagues in maternal fetal medicine and they said, well, it's very hard to do it because it's a curved shape. On the right, you see an ultrasound. The placenta is basically this crescent shaped object right here. And they said, it's just kind of difficult to do it. It's not like measuring the length of a bone. So I approached my father who was an engineer and a mathematician. And I said, dad, I have a mathematical problem for you. If I give you a cross section of a placenta, which is represented by this red crescent, and I give you the width, which is the tip to tip measurement here, the height and the thickness in centimeters, can you figure out the volume with an equation? And he developed that equation. And in fact, we showed that this is an accurate way to measure the volume of the placenta. And let me show you how easy it is. This is an example of a normal 18 week pregnancy. Here again is the placenta, the amniotic fluid and the fetus right here. You take this picture and draw from the tip to the tip, you get the width measurement in centimeters. And then if you find the apex right here and draw down to the baseline at right angles, 90 degrees, you get the height. And then if you add the third measurement, the thickness from the same apex point down to the end of the placenta here, you get the thickness. And these three numbers put into the equation give you the estimated placenta volume. So the first thing was for us to show that this actually was an accurate estimate of the final weight of the placenta after delivery. And so in 2010, we published a paper 
where we looked at 29 patients just before they delivered between 29 and 40.7 weeks. And we had done an estimated placental volume measurement on them. And then right after they delivered, we clamped the cord immediately to prevent blood from coming out and changing the weight. And we weighed the placental disc and we got this curve, which shows there's actually a very good correlation between the estimated placental volume measurement and the actual weight of the placenta. And this was published in 2010. And I'm proud to say my father is a co-author on that paper. Um, after that, we realized that it's not enough just to have an equation. You need to have what's called normative values. So we collected a series of 366 patients at Yale between 11 and almost 39 weeks. And we plotted them out. And with mathematics, we figured out the 10th the 10th, the 90th, and the 50th percentile lines, and these are known as normative curves. And we did the same thing at another institution at Cornell with 446 patients. And finally, one of my students recently in the Yale School of Medicine went to Senegal and collected over 1,000 data points of patients between five and 42 weeks of pregnancy. What's interesting to me is that when you superimpose all this data on top of each other, the 90th and the 10th and the 50th percentiles are almost superimposable, which shows that basically you can do this test almost anywhere. The results are accurate in whatever population you look at. And it really doesn't matter who the people are who are doing the ultrasounds because it's such a simple method. It's reliable on, in these three different institutions and locations, as I pointed out. Now, once you have these equations here, you can actually put them into the ultrasound machine and this is Dr. Umberto Aspura, who is the first person to do the first EPV. Here's a picture of that right here, where we were testing with this ultrasound to see if we could measure the estimated placental volume. So this is actually the first time it was done on a patient in 2008. Here is that ultrasound, and you can see the placenta on the bottom. Again, the width measurement, the height and the thickness and the final estimated placental volume, which in this case is 325 cubic centimeters. So because not every ultrasound machine has this equation built into it, we decided to make an app for it. And we made an iPhone app first. It's called Merwin's Calculator in honor of my father who came up with this equation. It's a very easy app, it's free. You can download it on the Apple App Store anytime. Just use Merwin's Calculator as the name. And if you have an ultrasound image of a placenta represented by this uh, red crescent here, and you put in the width, height, and thickness, and the gestational age, it will calculate the volume and the percentile. And this is very useful to be shown graphically. So you can see in this case, at 19 plus two weeks, this is a significantly small placenta, less than the 10th percentile. Now, because people were asking us to do this also for Android, we are very lucky enough to have Marnie Smith's husband, Michael Frederick, who works at Google, also make an equivalent Merwin's calculator app for Android phones. So there's really no reason now why you cannot do this and anybody can do this anytime, anyplace. So in summary, because of the data that we've collected from Beatrix Thompson's presentation and the work that she talked about, we now understand that the number one cause of stillbirth is a small placenta. This actually is even more impressive when you look at third trimester stillbirths. And in that case, 36% of those stillbirths are due to small placentas. So it suggests that maybe we should check women in the third trimester to see if the placenta is small. And I wanna end with one cautionary story about a patient who had a stillbirth, unfortunately, because of a very small placenta. And although they did not do estimated placental volume uh, studies on her, we looked at those ultrasounds and retrospectively we went back and said, well, if we had calculated the EPVs, what would we have found? And what we found is that at 20 weeks, the placental volume was basically normal, but it literally stopped growing. The fetus continued to grow and the fetus was ultimately about the 40th percentile while the placenta was less than the 0.1 percentile the ratio between the fetus being 10 to one, which is very abnormal. So this suggests that we should also look at least at 30 or 32 weeks in women just to make sure the placenta is not too small. 
I'd like to acknowledge my coworkers, Beatrix Thompson, who you heard before, Parker Holzer, who did the statistics on this, my father, my colleagues at Yale, and Michael Frederick for helping with the app development. Thank you.